We're going to take a look at Chiari malformations, what they are, how they happen, and what they cause. Now there are several types of Chiari malformations. There's a type 0, a type 1, a type 1.5, a type 2, a type 3, and a type 4. Clinically, however, type 1 and type 2 are what's really important. But I'll briefly explain the others at the end of this video. Some people call this the Arnold Chiari malformation. Uh, specifically, that's referred to in type 2 Chiari malformations. Dr. Hans Chiari is who the, this is named after. In the 1890s, he described, one, uh, he described types 1, 2, 3, and 4. In the early 1800s, another professor, Julius Arnold, described specifically type 2. So there's your history lesson. Briefly, let's review the anatomy of the cerebellum because that's what all of these disorders have to do with. So this would be the cerebellum. It sits on the back of the brain stem. This middle part of the cerebellum is called the vermis. And then if we look at the other side, we see down here that we have these things right here called tonsils. So vermis and tonsils. The order of development on this is actually quite important in distinguishing type 2 and type 1 because the vermis develops before, before the tonsils. And this is going to help you to understand the etiology and pathophysiology. Okay, so Chiari type 1 malformation, now it's usually abbreviated with C1M or with Roman numerals CIM. Now the really important distinguishing features of this is its tonsillar herniation. Now the most textbooks are going to say greater than 5 millimeters um, through the foramen magnum. However, a large study was done and it was found that anything between 3 to 5 millimeters in that intermediate range will either be asymptomatic or have borderline symptoms. So the point being if a person has a herniation of the tonsils at three, cent, uh, three millimeters and they have symptoms of a Chiari type 1 malformation, then they probably are having a Chiari type 1 malformation. However, when you do an MRI and you find somebody with no symptoms and they have a three millimeter herniation, then it's probably not a Chiari 1 malformation. And so whenever you find people between this three and five range, everything is symptomatically diagnosed. So the other thing you're going to see is syringomyelia is common, and I'll take a look at what that is here in a second. But hydrocephalus is very uncommon, and usually in most textbooks, Chiari 1 malformation is defined as not having hydrocephalus or increased cranial pressure. However, I did see one textbook on clinical keys that reported that you can have in, uh, hydrocephalus, it's just not very common. Let's take a quick look at what syringomyelia is. It's defined as a cyst or cavity that forms within the spinal cord. And so we have a picture over here. I'll try to highlight it in blue. We have this cyst, this cavity that's formed within the canal of the spinal cord. So if you just have excess fluid in the spinal cord, it's called hydromyelia. But whenever that fluid presses into and dissects into the spinal cord, it's syringomyelia. And let's take a cross-sectional look really quick at what this causes. So here I have two sections of the spinal cord, here at C2 and at C3. And we're going to pretend like all the stuff in the middle is still there, but we've drawn it so that it's not shown. Nerve fibers that sense pain will come in and into the spinal cord about right here. Then some of these fibers will go up one or two places, or they will go down one or two spinal segments. And then, of course, some of them will not go up or down at all. They'll just enter into the spinal cord. Whenever they enter into the spinal cord, they go down, they cross the anterior white commissure and settle down right here. These are the fibers that carry pain and temperature sensation. It's called the anterior lateral system or sometimes the spinothalamic tract. And so this is happening up here as well. So we have all this, and then whenever these fibers are here, they travel up into the brain from that point. So the point is that different fibers cross over differently. With the spinothalamic tract or anterior lateral system, they cross over almost immediately or within one to two spinal segments.
Now with syringal myelia, you have increased uh, fluid moving into the central canal, and it's compressing everything. And what it will do is it will compress on these fibers in the anterior white commissure, and so you'll have anything within one to two spinal segments of this lesion will lose sensation of pain and temperature in that area. Now, syringomyelia is typically in the cervical region, and so what you get is a cape-like distribution, loss of pain and temperature sensation. So here's a Polaroid picture of my roommate, Jonathan. He has syringomyelia. So all along his arm, up around his chest and around his back, he will not sense pain, so he can touch the hot plate and think it's okay. So in review, you have tonsillar herniation, syringomyelia, no hydrocephalus, no brainstem herniation. This is Chiari 1 malformation. Due to the syringomyelia, you get the cape-like loss of pain. You also get something called a Vassalvo maneuver induced pain. The Vassalvo maneuver is basically like holding your breath and grunting. It's, it's what you do when you poop. So if a person gets pain in their head or neck whenever they poop, cough, or perform the Vassalvo maneuver, this may be due to a Chiari 1 malformation. The idea behind this is that the, basically the flow of cerebrospinal fluid eventually flows out into the venous system, and by performing the Vassalvo maneuver, you're preventing it from moving out into the venous system, and you're causing a, short, a slight buildup of pressure, and that pressure feeds back down into the syringomyelia. And again, the exact reason for this right now, nobody knows. But the basic theory is what I just explained. So Chiari 1 malformations have a basic breakdown of symptoms. You can have occipital cervical headaches. You can have in the brainstem respiratory problems, nystagmus. You can also have facial sensory problems. And basically, if you think of any cranial nerve that's in the brainstem, then there's a small chance that it can get compressed and you can get that cranial nerve involvement. Thus, the facial sensory from cranial nerve 7, nystagmus from cranial nerve 8, and the likelihood of each of these uh, cranial nerve involvements is correlated with where they are in the brainstem. So cranial nerve 7 and 8 fairly low in the brainstem, and so they have a higher likelihood of having lesions. With the cerebellum, you can have ataxia, clumsiness, hiccups. With the spine, like we just said, you can get sensory loss, but you can also get motor and sensory loss. With the motor loss, it will present either as upper lower or both upper and lower motor neuron. And the basic explanation for this is that anytime you have any compression of the spinal cord, any motor neuron leaving at the site of compression is going to be a lower motor neuron. But anything below the site of compression, it's going to be the tract of the upper motor neuron. So again, at the site of compression, you get lower motor neuron symptoms. Below it, you can have upper motor neuron symptoms. And then something like 70 to 80% of people at diagnosis will have either, either ophthalmologic or otologic problems. It's important to note that with Chiari malformation type 2, it's usually almost always congenital. With type 1, it can be either congenital or acquired. And unlike Chiari malformation type 2, there is no association with age and symptoms. However, with infants that have this problem, one thing you may notice is poor feeding, poor suckling, dysphagia, and so some of these are going to be presenting symptoms in, in the infants that you'll notice. However, it's not going to be at an, any different rate than what you would see with somebody who gets this at, say, age 50. Okay, let's talk differential diagnosis and etiology. On the differential, the main thing you want to do is rule out any cause of hydrocephalus. Anything that causes an increased intracranial pressure can cause the tonsils themselves to be displaced into the foramen magnum. When it's caused by hydrocephalus, then it's not Chiari 1 malformation. Why is that, you say? And what causes Chiari 1 malformation? I'm glad you asked. With Chiari 1 malformation, there is a strong association with bony malformations especially in the posterior fossa. So let's draw a head. I'm going to draw it as if I've cut the top off of it. So here I have the cella turcica. 
I have my superior cranial fossa, my middle and inferior cranial or posterior cranial fossa. And then in the posterior cranial fossa I have the foramen magnum. And then here sets my cerebellum. So we got cerebrum up here, we got the the midbrain right there, and then we have the cerebellum. If the bony structure in this posterior cranial fossa is messed up, it can actually push the tonsils down into the foramen magnum, and that is what is thought to be one of the major etiologies of the Chiari 1 malformation. The other thing that can cause this is a loss of spinal fluid. And that can happen at any place from the cranium down through the spinal cord. Now interestingly enough, Chiari 1 malformations are linked to growth hormone deficiencies. However, in the case we're looking at this week, we see a Chiari, uh, Chiari malformation with multiple endocrine neoplasia, including growth hormone excess. Now, I'm currently hypothesizing that this could be idiopathic or it could have to do with either the thyroid or parathyroid effect on the posterior fossa as well as any number of other things to do with bony growth. Also with multiple endocrine neoplasia, cerebellar and fourth ventricle ependymomas are, are common. And these are things that you actually have to rule out whenever you're working up a Chiari malformation. So it might be in the case that we're looking at this week, there actually is no Chiari malformation, that it's actually a cerebellar ependymoma. I think we're going to find out on Wednesday. Now Chiari type 2 malformations. These are strongly associated with a lumbosacral myelomeningeal seal. And in fact, that's the major etiology. Just as a quick review, a myelomeningeal seal is when you have both a herniation of the myelin of the spinal cord as well as the spinal uh, cauda equina itself. If there is no spinal tissue out in this herniation then it's just called a meningocil. And as you can see it's just like skin and connective tissue that's holding all of this fluid in and so there's decreased intracranial pressure whenever this first starts to form. This illness or defect falls under a, a larger family called tube, neural tube defects. And here in a second we'll take a look at how that causes Chiari type 2 malformations. So another thing that's associated with it is a shallow posterior fossa and an, an enlarged frame and magnum. Now these do not cause the Chiari malformation but these are caused by the Chiari malformation most of the time. Now in this last little tidbit, 80% of cases present at birth with hydrocephalus. This is sort of contradicted in another textbook, but I think most of my sources had something like this. And we'll take a look at exactly what the other textbook says here in a second. Now of course I'll point out like I have in the past, when I import PowerPoints into this software, sometimes it'll cut off the bottom. And I went ahead and typed in hydrocephalus instead of writing it in. I have poor handwriting, you probably already know that. And I think that's good because if I had bad handwriting, patients wouldn't believe I was a real doctor. So what is exactly different from a Chiari type 2 malformation from a, than a Chiari type 1 malformation? With a type 2, it's a herniation of the vermis, not the tonsils. So let's talk about the etiology of this. Why do we get the vermis herniation and not the tonsil? Well, the vermis is the first to develop. And when the vermis is developing, if there is a low intracranial pressure, then there's nothing holding the vermis within the cranial fossa. And it will move down into the frame and magnum. So we have the vermis moving into the frame and magnum. What is causing the low intracranial pressure? Well, it could be a number of things, but most commonly, there's a myelomeningocele. McLone and Nepper in 1989 put together their unified theory describing all of the etiology, pathophysiology of these Chiari type 2 malformations. Now why do you get the decreased depth in the posterior cranial fossa? In their unified theory, they explain that part of the development of the cranium and the brain itself is contributed by pressure from the cerebrospinal fluid. And so with that decreased pressure, you're going to have 
problems with the cranium as well. Now with Chiari type 2 malformation, there's a strong connection between the age and the symptoms that are seen. In the textbook that lineated these out, it said that newborns tend to be asymptomatic, and I don't know if hydrocephalus and asymptomatic go together. I haven't looked into it. I'm just a medical student. Give me a break. But in past cases where we've seen a hydrocephalus, there have also been other symptoms to go along with that. For example, a large head, vomiting, sleepiness, irritability, poor feeding, and a baby, seizures, etc., etc. Forgive me, I'm on my fourth Red Bull this evening. With infants a little bit older than newborn, you usually see brain stem problems. With older children and young adults, that's when you start seeing the spinal, cerebellar, and ophthalmologic problems. Okay, really quickly, let's talk about the Chiari malformations that I didn't mention. Uh, type 1.5 is the easiest. It's just where you only have one tonsil herniated instead of two. So they call it 1.5. I, I would call it 0 0.5. They need to have me naming these things. Now type 0, well remember type 1 is tonsil herniation and syringomyelia. Type 0 is just syringomyelia, no tonsillar herniation, and the syringomyelia must respond to decompression therapy. So type 3, that is an encephalocele with herniation of the brainstem and cerebellum into that encephalocele. So here I went ahead and put a picture of what an encephalocele looks like. So basically it's just another type of neural tube defect. Instead of happening at the base of the spine, it's happening at the top of the head. You remember with myelomeningocele, you had nervous tissue that was in a herniated sac with the meninges. This is basically like the myelomeningocele at the top of the head. You have nervous tissue in a herniated sac. And that specific nervous tissue is brainstem and cerebellum. Now type 4 is no longer classified technically as a Chiari malformation, but Hans Chiari, when he did these, he described 1, 2, 3, and 4, and he classified them all as rhombencephalic malformations. Now, if you remember, the rhombencephalon includes both the brainstem and the cerebellum. So type 4, as it was described by Hans Chiari, is hypoplasia or aplasia of the cerebellum. So if the cerebellum doesn't completely form or if it doesn't form at all, that would be a type 4 Chiari malformation. These have since been reclassified as posterior fossa cysts. So quick overview, type 0 is syringomyelia that responds to decompression. Type 1, you have herniation of the tonsils and syringomyelia. Type 1.5, just one tonsil. Call it type 0 0.5. I dare you. Type 2, you have herniation of the vermis and is strongly associated with myelomeningocele. Type 3, same thing as type 2, only at the top of the head. And type 4, you have no cerebellum.